So first speaker today is, uh, is Natalie Munro. And she, Natalie is obviously an associate professor in, at the Department of um, Speech Pathology. And uh, she's going to start us off today talking about child language assessment, the good, the bad, and no, not the ugly, the way forward. <laughs> so I will hand this now to um, Natalie, um, although Andy's there, maybe she's going to assist us to get. That's okay, I'm, I'm on it. You're on it, good. Yeah. Uh, just give me a moment. Okay. Thanks, Kerry, for the introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, let's get going. Good. To, <laughs> the race is on. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about um, a language assessment, child language assessment. And in order to diagnose developmental language disorder, we need evidence of significance. Uh, its functional impact would be that educational and psychosocial impacts and um, whether or not the language disorder is persistent. And to do that, we require multiple um, sources of data, assessment data. And just as a little recap, we can um, assess uh, language across uh, multiple domains from syntax to pragmatics. We can look at different levels at word utterance or discourse levels, and we can also look at comprehension and expression. So we've got a lot to do. And um, I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Deb Denman. And um, the first half of this talk is part of her um, uh, PhD uh, re results. And uh, I've given you a QR code here to um, look at her ResearchGate um, profile. And there, of course, is uh, her <laughs> supervisory team. I kind of look about two decades younger there. Might need to update that profile picture. All right, so my talk's broken down into two parts. I'm going to outline Australian speech pathologist child language assessment practices when working with four to 12 year olds. And um, the second half is, is hypothetical assessment scenarios um, to discuss uh, available options to us. And I'm going to use my emoticon, uh, you know, scaffold of good, bad and ways forward. So let's move on to the first bit. Um, so Deb um, uh, surveyed 407 speech pathologists back in 2018 in Australia who were uh, providing a service to at least 40 uh, kids with language disorder in the previous year. So we have some level of um, acknowledgement of their clinical um, expertise. The pro demographic profile is on, listed on the screen and I'm interested in presenting some of the demographic data, the frequency of the assessment types that were used, the assessments that were actually listed by the speech pathologist and their reasons and purposes for using them. One of the strengths of Deb's work is that the survey utilised um, terminology for describing assessment types and purposes, and this was done through an agreed upon um, taxonomy developed through a Delphi consensus study. Um, and so the consensus that was obtained on terminology relating to modalities and domains of assessment, the purpose and delivery and form of that assessment. It's nothing better than consistency in child language. Okay, over to the demographic sample characteristics. You can see across the top row, uh, the states and territories around Australia, and then the agencies um, listed in the first column. And in the state that I live in, in New South Wales, um, for the predominant uh, survey respondents worked in private schools. Someone has um, their audio on. Um, now I'm going to show you some uh, assessment where the speech pathologist has um, uh, reported the most, um, uh, how often they have used these different assessment forms from data type, task type, the environment and the dynamic um, nature of the assessment. So you'll see that over 80% of speech pathologists in Australia are using norm reference testing. Um, we know that uh, over two thirds of the speech survey respondents are using decontextualized tasks. And these are things like measuring so your skills, um, such as sentence completion tasks, I will email. for example, um, as opposed to contextualized tasks, which are more meaningful interactions, perhaps such as um, language sampling analysis or language sampling. Um, whereas activity focused tasks might be things like looking at um, observe, observing a child during free play um, with their peers at lunchtime. And in terms of the environment, over 
Um, nearly 80% of speech pathologists are assessing in a clinical context. And then um, if we look at the uh, dynamic assessment procedures, uh, fewer respondents are using test teach retest or dynamic gradual prompting. Um, which was interesting to note because I think around 15% of the survey respondents indicated that they um, indicated that more than half of the uh, 40 uh, students that they assessed for child language were from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. So in summary, what we can Thank say is that speech pathologists yeah. in Australia are using norm reference testing and contextual like... tasks and in the clinical context. And then we are also interested in investigating factors such as service agency years of experience and geographical location and whether or not this influenced um, the frequency of different types of assessments. So norm reference assessment was influenced by service agency. Um, speeches in private practice are nearly four times more likely to regularly use norm reference measures than speeches in disability agencies. And, similar, and similarly, uh, speeches in disability agencies have 15 times greater odds to use activity focused assessments uh, compared to speech pathologists working in private practice. Um, we also looked at some geographical differences. So we do have some state differences occurring. Um, speech pathologists in WA compared to New South Wales speech pathologists had four times greater odds to use contextualized assessments. So things like language sampling, 2.35 times greater odds to use dynamic teach test retest procedures and three times greater odds to use dynamic gradual prompting assessments. Moving on to um, what actual, what were the actual language measures used um, or reported to be used by speech pathologists in Australia, uh, 139 language measures were actually reported in the survey. And these are our top five. So we've got the cell family, the wrapped and the spat. Um, moving over to um, assessment purposes, on the first column, you'll see the different types of um, purposes of assessment. And then on the um, top row, you'll see the top five um, uh, speech, uh, child, sorry, child language assessments used by speech pathologists regularly. And what you'll um, see is that speech pathologists are using the cell family predominantly for diagnostic purposes. They're using the RAPT for screening purposes, which is kind of curious because the RAPT doesn't provide uh, criterion scores for pass or fail. And um, they're using the SPAT for selecting intervention. And then when we ask speech pathologists about their reasons for using these top five uh, instruments, you'll see that um, the cell family reasons um, for using the cell are Australian norms, good psychometrics, and employers um, requiring use of these tools, as opposed to the RAPT, which is uh, reported to be more quick to administer, quick to score, and then the SPAT for meaning for good select, selecting um, goals and quick to score. So this brings me to the second part of my talk, which is to present some assessment scenarios and discuss the good, the bad and ways forward. Yeah, and then we'll the whole scenario oh, yeah. is about assessing discourse level language with utterance level instruments. So the good, okay, it's really good that you're thinking about discourse. Fantastic, because discourse actually means function, right? If we need to identify language disorder, we need to assess function. So on the next few slides, what I've got are some QR codes to some resources that I think can help us move forward. Um, and I'm gonna talk about these in brief um, in a minute, but just for now, if you want to get your cameras, and then if you don't know these resources, you can use the QR codes to find the, the various links to them. So what's bad about using utterance level instruments? Our predominant use of the wrapped and the self versions are not or largely not discourse level assessments. And really ways forward, we have amazing discourse level assessments. We actually have the resources and evidence to change this practice. So I would encourage you to look at the top QR code to look at Dr. Uh, Suze Leiteo's um, uh, website and the amazing work that they've been doing at Discourse for uh, in Curtin, um, in Curtin University in the West, and then over in the East, Marlene Vesterveld's um, from Griffith University, language sampling ana analysis, narrative retail, um, amazing, amazing work in that. And then in the US, the language dynamic group have also produced some narrative language measures as well. Our second scenario relates to assessing children who are multilingual. It's a really growing desire and need for amongst our profession to learn more about cultural responsiveness. responsiveness. Uh, but we, you know, um, we really 
really need to move from norm, norm reference testing for our multilingual population. Um, it's just it's just not um, fitting the bill. And, and I would urge you to look at some of these resources, some assessment options. I'm just reflecting on Deb's um, uh, findings that we're not using dynamic assessment as much as what we should. Um, the top QR code relates to Dr. Liz Pena's work on dynamic assessment and the mediated learning observation form. Um, it's really good uh, evidence for classifying um, using the total cognitive score from that uh, meaning a mediated learning observation form. The second link actually links to the paper um, that describes where these cuts, cutoff scores come from to identify language disorder or not in children who are, are bilingual. And then the bottom QR code is Dr. Vesterville, um, who's the uh, chair of the International Association of Communication and Sciences and Disorders. And she discusses the, uh, the Global TALS project, which is developing a protocol for eliciting personal event narratives um, that accounts for cultural differences in personal narrative structure. Our third assessment scenario is assessing non-compliant children. Um, these children and young people are our most vulnerable, so keep at it. Um, kudos to the speech pathologists around Australia who are working in this assessment context. The, the bad, you know, don't use non-reference uh, data when your client is older or not from the same SES area than the non-reference test. You know, another recommendation, assessing for diagnostic purposes, you're going to get the highest non-compliance rate uh, if you try to um, submit um, assessing with an omnibus comprehensive test, they'll throw it at you. Instead, how about we consider assessing for describing communicative um, status or for selecting intervention goals? And ways forward, let's look at functional and participation-based assessments. Let's be student-centered. Uh, the first QR code link, links back to Karen James's work where she uses an assessment to describe the status of her um, students who are presenting with behavioural difficulties. The second QR code relates to a tool that's freely available called the Functional Abilities Classification Tool. And in that, they measure function in the school context and participation using the ICF. Scenario four, assessing population using screeners. What an opportunity, but partner with the community, right? Let's get asking the community what they want, what their needs are and how to, and how to help that, how to partner with them. Don't use non-reference omnibus comprehensive tests, too long, too intensive, too expensive. But on the other hand, don't just pick something up because it's quick to administer. Recording in progress. Let's consider some screeners. So in the QR code listed above, there's a list of screeners uh, including the student language scale, the screener for language and literacy disorders. Um, and the second QR code is Dr. Hogan's See, Hear and Speak podcast with guest um, Professor Elena Plan. And it's a fascinating listen. So to wrap up, you, in, in terms of child language assessment, your intended purpose should equal, must equal the intended purpose of an instrument. In Deb's taxonomy, we have seven reasons for assessment. Have a look and stop the bus and think, is my purpose um, the same as the intended purpose of the instrument? If it's not, if your intended purpose is not aligned with the intended purpose of an instrument, again, stop and ask, is this a valid approach? If yes, go ahead, but be mindful of the data that you're obtaining. Be, um, if it's not a valid approach, there's going to be another way. Let's learn about it and find out how to do it and adopt it. So in closing, developmental language disorder requires us to um, measure the significance, the functional impact and the persistence. And so we require multiple sources of data, not just norm reference tests. Here is a list of references and I'm looking forward to um, chatting with you more. Thank you. Here are your mute. It's not, um, oh, there we go. Sorry, Nat uh, Natalie, thank you very much. That was a whirlwind uh, a talk, very fascinating work. Um, <laughs> take a glass of water. Yes. Uh, we are happy to take questions now. We have about uh, five minutes question time. If um, people would like to put some questions in the Padlet or in the, um, in the chat box, I think we have a question here. Is there a rationale for ever using the self with a child from a cold school age uh, school age client culturally linguistically diverse school age client 
Um, in terms of cultural linguistically diverse assessment, you need to think about the length of exposure that the child has to language one and language two, right? So um, uh, that, that's the first thing, exposure matters. So if I'd be asking about taking a, a thorough interview, looking at language exposure um, and identifying whether or not there are concerns in um, the home language or the community language um, to indicate whether or not there's language disorder. Because if you don't, um, if you don't do that, then the, the, the problems in English, for example, might just be language difference and, and an exposure issue. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, I have a, qu a request for you to go back to the third set of QR codes. Okay. <laughs> um, and a couple of comments here saying thank you very much. It was great, fascinating resources, very interesting. Any other questions? Oh, there's a Sorry. question coming in. Was it that I, one? Um, the called question was mine. My name is Varney. Hi, and Barney. I just wanted to follow up. Hi, Nat. How are you? Good. Um, so, Nat, the reason I asked about using the self with called clients is, for example, <laughs> if they're at school, say they're in year five or six, and they've actually been exposed to English for a long time, but they don't have a home language exposure of English, is there some necessity for us to have a look at their English skills while keeping in mind exactly what you've said about checking about their home language usage and whether the difficulties are in both languages and things like that. Mm. Um, I think if the a parent and teacher concern uh, is evident that, you know, the child is having difficulty with learning, um, uh, using language, learning language with, with English, um, and you've got some evidence that parental concern for using um, the home language, then... then <laughs> I think it'd be important to consider doing an assessment. I don't necessarily think it needs to be a non-reference test from the get-go, you know, because the nature of a language disorder is that they have problems learning language um, and perhaps a more um, uh, assessment, a diagnostic assessment is not really required um, if, if you can, you know, start off with uh, interviewing and, and a dynamic assessment procedure, language sampling procedure, um, and ideally comparing that with some uh, students from a similar cultural linguistic background as well, I think that's going to be more informative than, than you know, going through a number of non-reference um, subtests, personally. All right. Uh, I think there was a... Um, could you go back to the um, scenario three, please? Were there there you go. Cute, Sorry. Cute, 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 cute. <laughs> no, that's all right. Yeah. Um, and once people have had a look at that, also wanting the QR codes for the CALD called and also another look at the references. So you have to double task here, Nat. Okay. Um, but All a question, right. I know, a question is, I know that TILS is being used more broadly in the mm. US. Is it being used much in Australia? Um, anecdotally, I know that some uh, clinical groups are taking up the, the TILS. It has good diagnostic accuracy. Um, uh, it is very, very comprehensive um, and uh, our child language team at Sydney are um, working up the resources to teach using the TILS. Um, it's going to take some time for that to, to you know, reach out to um, further clinical practice. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, I think uh, we're going to have to move on. Um, yeah. We will have to move on, but I'm sure, Nat... Um, I can share my slides. I'm very happy to share these. And also probably you can come along to the discussion of the two can yeah. be better and uh, Natalie. Yeah, I'm happy to do that, that too. Great. I'm going to mute you, Natalie. Sorry to be rude.